reading from the second letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. Brothers and sisters, whoever boasts should boast in the Lord. For it is not the one who recommends himself who is approved, but the one whom the Lord recommends. If only you would put up with a little foolishness from me. Please put up with me, for I am jealous of you with the jealousy of God, since I betrothed you to one husband to present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Verbum Domini. The Lord hears the cry of the poor. The Lord hears the cry of the poor. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall be ever in my mouth. Let my soul glory in the Lord. The lowly will hear me and be glad. The Lord hears the cry of the poor. Look to him that you may be radiant with joy, and your faces may not blush with shame. When the poor one called out, the Lord heard, and from all his distress, he saved him. The Lord hears the cry of the poor. The Lord confronts the evildoers to destroy remembrance of them from the earth. When the just cry out, the Lord hears them, and from all their distress, he rescues them. The Lord hears the cry of the poor. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted, and those who are crushed in spirit he saves. The Lord redeems the lives of his servants. No one incurs guilt who takes refuge in him. The Lord hears the cry of the poor. Alleluia, alleluia. sins of your people. Alleluia, 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 alleluia. Dominus vobisco, et cum spiritus tuo, Lexio Sancti Vangei Secundum Mateum, Jesus told his disciples this parable. The kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, five were wise. The foolish ones, when taking their lamps, brought no oil with them, but the wise brought flasks of oil with their lamps. Since the bridegroom was long delayed, they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight there was a cry, Behold, the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those virgins got up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise ones replied, No, for there may not be enough for us and you. Go instead to the merchants and buy some for yourselves. While they went out to buy it, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went into the wedding feast with him. Then the door was locked. Afterwards, the other virgins came and said, Lord, Lord, Open the door for us. But he said in reply, Amen, I say to you, I do not know you. Therefore, stay awake, for you know neither the day nor the hour. 
Verbum Domini. Laudator Jesus Christus, praise be Jesus Christ, now and forever. It's a great pleasure to be here always, but especially that we have Father Miguel with us today. He was assigned his deacon year at Mount St. Mary Seminary as deacon at my, par my two parishes, Our Lady Good Council in Marysville and St. Bernadette in Duncannon. And my parishioners often talk about Father Miguel, Father Miguel, how much they miss Father Miguel, how young Father Miguel is and still looks, his wonderful homilies and his wonderful pastoral service. So Father Miguel, everybody says hello from Perry County. And speaking of Mount St. Mary's, remember again to keep the guys in your prayers. This is day two of the finals. All right, so they're still sweating away and they need your, they need your prayers. Today is also the feast of St. Lucy. One of my particularly favorite saints. She's the patron saint of Sicily, where my father's family comes from, and in particular, the city of Syracuse, or in English they call it Syracuse. Not New York, this is Sicily. My family's from the town of Augusta, which is in the province of Syracuse. And St. Lucy, was born towards the tail end of the third century and died in the very first part of the fourth century. A young girl, very devout, who decided early on she wanted to commit herself to Christ as a, as a virgin. She wanted to remain single and, in a sense, be a bride of Christ. Her mother, however, had other ideas because once her father died, her mother wanted her to be married, and so she found... Um, a pagan suitor who was well off financially but unfortunately this pagan suitor had a violent hatred for Christians the mother still wanted Lucy to marry him though because it would give her a stable and safe life but Lucy did not want to go her mother had a problem with hemorrhages and Lucy convinced her mother let's go to the shrine of St. Agatha He's another patron saint uh, in Sicily. And so they went to the shrine of St. Agatha, prayed, and the mother's hemorrhages miraculously went away. So the mother learned, uh-oh, this daughter of mine knows something. So she said, okay, if you don't want to marry that guy, that's fine with me. However, the boyfriend didn't see it the same way. And he was very, very angry. In fact, it infuriated him that not only did she turn him down, but he was going to use the fact that she was a Christian against her. And so he denounced her, because remember, this was still the time of the Roman persecutions, and if you were publicly exposed as a Christian, it was the death penalty. And so they tried to arrest her, and one of the, the tales that is told in the pious tradition is that when they tried to pick her up, all of a sudden she weighed more than like an elephant, all right? Even though she was a petite girl, she wasn't like this. But they couldn't move her. They kept trying and trying, and it was just like the more they tried, the more difficult it was to move her. Then they got outraged. The old boyfriend was even getting more upset. And one of the other stories is that he had her eyes gouged out. That's why she's the patron saint of eyes. Many times there's a statue or picture of her holding a plate of her eyes. So she's invoked for anybody who has problems with vision, whether it's blindness, cataracts, glaucoma, cancer of the eye, detached retina, anything you could think of. She was also, they, they stabbed her finally to death because of this outrage that she wouldn't, she wouldn't die. But as she was dying, she was praying for her persecutors, not cursing them, but praying for them. Her name, Lucia, Lucy, bearer of light. Jesus tells us in the gospel, you are the light of the world. 
let your light shine before men. You don't put a candle or lamp under a bushel basket. The lamp is meant to be seen. It has a practical purpose to it. Likewise, if Jesus says, you are the light, you put yourself on the stand. You don't hide yourself under a bushel basket. But so many people are afraid today to show that they are a Christian. So many Catholic Christians are afraid to show that this is their faith. Now there is a difference between bullying someone because of one's faith. We're not shoving our faith down anyone's throat. That would be wrong. Lucia did not do that. But to be proud, to be joyful of one's faith, even if it means persecution, maybe physically, as it happened in the case with St. Lucy, it cost her her life. And you and I know, <laughs> we live in a time now where physical martyrdom is not just possible. Many parts of the world, it's very probable. How many times ISIS and Al-Qaeda are butchering Christians one after another, destroying, desecrating churches, killing priests and nuns, setting them on fire, beheading them. And now they're coming on our turf to do it to us here. So no longer can we say, oh, martyrdom is something of the past. It's now. But most of us, will not suffer a physical martyrdom, but perhaps very likely a dry or white martyrdom, where it's not shedding of your blood, but people make fun of you. They ridicule you. They ignore you. I gave a talk once several years ago in Saskatchewan, Canada, in a town called Regina. And I was told by one of the people there that she got turned into the police you want to know for what? For having a statue of the Blessed Mother in her front lawn. Now when she told me that, I thought, well, maybe it must have been like this 40-foot statue that blocked the view or something like that. This is how big it was. It was so small that you couldn't even see it because of the fence. But the next-door neighbor, who was a Hindu, objected that she had a Blessed Mother statue on her property in her front lawn. And the only one who could see this is the neighbor when she peeked out her window. But she called the police. And there was some law that prevented you from publicly displaying your religion in that town. Imagine. Now, I don't know what the lady did after that, but I said, I know what me and my Sicilian family would have done. Then we built a bigger one, all right? <laughs> Huge 50-foot statue with lights on it, okay? <laughs> Aimed right next door. <laughs> now most of us aren't gonna go through that, but people will talk about you. They're talking about you right now. You got up early in the morning, you came to daily mass, you go to confession, you read the scriptures, you pray the rosary, you watch EWTN, ooh. Shame, shame, shame. They think we're nuts. So what? So what? Do you think Lucy was worried about how she was perceived? Of course not. She rather remained pure. In fact, one of the tales say that the judge was outraged with her, that they went to send her to a brothel, thinking that this will tarnish her virginity. It didn't work. She died at a young age, as many of the early martyrs did, but she did so joyfully, not because she wanted to die. You know, that's one thing we have to point out, too, to people, that when you're a martyr, you're a victim. You're not a villain. These people who call themselves martyrs are the ones who are killing people. That is the antithesis of martyrdom. It's an oxymoron. You cannot be a, a martyr and kill people. You are the one being killed. You're being killed because of your faith. You're not taking people out. That's a murderer, a terrorist. But a holy martyr 
is a victim. An unwilling victim in the sense that you're not looking for this, but it finds you. And that's what Lucy did. She embraced the path that was set before her. And because of her, and as St. Augustine said, the blood of martyrs became the seed of Christians, all the blood that was shed for 300 years during the Roman persecutions, that soaked the ground of the empire and brought forth so many saints Martyrs and non-martyrs alike. So many saints that in fact, in the Holy Eucharistic Prayer, the first one called the Roman Canon, we list all these saints to remind us that most of them lived in the first couple hundred years of the church and died a martyr's death. Most of the popes in the first couple centuries died a martyr's death. All the apostles but one suffered a martyr's death, although they tried to kill St. John a number of times. I boiled him in oil. Or as they say in New York, Earl. <laughs> Burl him and Earl. I heard one of, my, uh, one of my relatives say once, Earl. That's how we call him in, in New York. I said, oh, okay. <laughs> but he's the only one that escaped. Everyone else suffered a martyr's death. And you and I must be bearers of light in the sense that our life shines. Not blinding people like a deer on the highway, but that our light illuminates. If you and I live a good, holy, pious, devout life, it will allow people to see the love of God, the mercy of God, the truth of God. So it must be a subtle light in that sense. It's not blinding, but it illuminates. It allows people to see the truth by you and I living a good life, by giving good example. Not in the words we speak, because words many times are ignored, but by deeds. How do we live? Do we practice our faith? Do we practice the corporal and spiritual works of mercy? Do we show kindness and patience to people? You know, how can you call yourself a Christian, go to church, pray every day, and then treat people with disrespect? It doesn't, it's not consistent. You and I have to treat each other with respect and dignity because we are brothers and sisters in Christ. We are made in the image and likeness of God. So it means we have to be respectful to others. Even the ones we disagree with. Even the ones who hate us. Even the ones who wish us harm. Jesus says, pray for those who hate you and persecute you. So it's a tough job being a Christian. But if we do it, then that life will shine. So the saints lived these wonderful lives that they were truly like lamps. But sometimes we're like the foolish virgins who we got a lamp, but there's no earl. <laughs> we were stupid. We didn't bring extra with us. Fearing, oh, I got enough. You don't know the day nor the hour. We had a seminarian from Mount St. Mary's this past summer. Young man, he, was, he would have been ordained a deacon this coming year. Drowned to death, saving someone's life. Took his life jacket off, put it on her so she could be saved, and he ended up drowning. Ryan Burtkamp. What a testimony. He put someone else's life ahead of his own. His brother, who was a year ahead of him, a deacon, preached at his mass. They couldn't find his body for several weeks. But what power it was at that mass that the bishop and all the priests and seminarians, he came to my parish like Father Miguel did as a seminarian, visited the sick. There was no halo when you turn off the lights. He didn't glow in the dark. You know, very normal, healthy, well-balanced guy. But he took his faith seriously. You know, not the day nor the hour. A young man in his 20s. My brother was killed by a drunk driver when he was only 33 years old. My other brother died when he was 26 from muscular dystrophy. You don't know the day nor the hour. Father Levis that we buried this past June, 95. You know not the day nor the hour. But keep that lamp full. 
Don't be a foolish virgin, be a wise one. Keep it full and keep it burning brightly by living a good, holy, and saintly life. May God bless us and Mary keep us.